Okay, uh, I think I'll start. Video and color spacing. So I'm a, a co-maintainer of the video for Linux subsystem of the Linux kernel. And sort of second part of last year, I got some questions about color spaces and I realized that I didn't really knew what it was all about. So bought a bunch of books, started researching, experimenting. And I'm definitely no expert, but I know a heck of a lot more now. And this talk is really going into some of the backgrounds of it and especially what are the practical consequences of what is going on. And hopefully I can have a nice demo later as well. What the hell is color? Let's start with that. Um, the first thing that you need to know about is what's called the spectral power, power distribution. So basically I'm looking at an, an object and I'm getting light of different wavelengths, they hit my eye. And the spectral power distribution basically gives you for the wavelength, this is a nanometer, so it's a visible spectrum, how much power do you get in those wavelengths from the object. Uh, these are a few ABC, there are a few standard light sources, standardized light, light sources, and these are the power spectral power distribution. Um, sounds great. So that's that's physical the physical thing that gives you color. Just you get light of different wavelengths into your eye with certain intensity. Um, your eye does not have what is it? Uh, 350 different uh, uh, wavelengths detected. We have to do with three. Short wave, medium wave, long wave, uh, usually called the SML. And it's not that they are specific to one wavelength, they have an uh, overlap and they, they detect certain ranges, but with different <coughs> efficiencies. What this means in practice is that light with a certain spectral distribution, power distribution, hits the eye and it is converted in basically three values, uh, electrical intensities of electrical impulses. One for each cone, so short wave, medium wave, long wave. And those three values are what are interpreted as color by your brain. Because you're you basically having uh, the spectral power distribution can have many, many, infinite many different uh, 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 wave, uh, you know, uh, graphs, but they're all reduced to just three values. That means that there is an infinite number of spectral power distributions that will give you the same value. So to reproduce a color on a display or on a photograph, you do not have to reproduce the spectral power distribution. You just have to fake it so that what your eye, the, the, the three intensities that your eye sees are the same as the original. But the actual spectral power distribution can be and will look totally different. So it is a pure core, it's a pure illusion. What you have on the display there has absolutely nothing to do with the original. It's all fake. The whole point is that the, the, the light emitting or whatever lamp, whatever is in there, they create the illusion of the same color. Now these three colors that is pure biological. Um, uh, different uh, species can have different number of light sensitive elements in the eyes with the record holder uh, that I found is the mantis print that is sensitive to 12 different colors. So an RGB display that wouldn't work for them. They would need an, uh, uh, one with 12 different components, color components in order to reproduce a color that they can see. So that's where the three, the RGB, the three values come from that's purely related to what your biological eye is doing. Um, now, of course, the next step is your brain <coughs> that is interpreting it, and that is can show up really weird things. If you know, this is, I think, the strongest optical illusion that I know. There may be others, but certainly, 
I, is one I cannot unsee. I see uh, orange, mag magenta, uh, blue, and green there. However, blue and green are the same color. Why are you moving? Yeah, I have to go back and nobody believes it. <laughs> green, blue. No, same color. I have, I have been experimenting with this before, just, you know, blocking out uh, just a little bit of that. I keep seeing it, only when I'm, when I'm almost getting rid of the magenta, then it suddenly turns, it, it sort of slightly, very slowly actually, it just turns, changes color until it's back to green. It's an ex I, and I have not seen a convincing explanation of this. There are some people, who th there are a few ideas that people have, but this is the single one that I believe. Uh, doesn't seem to fit. Uh, it's, it's an amazing one. Um, so whatever, so this is what I'm basically saying, color is a very big reason. But, you know, computer scientists, we do have to try and reproduce color. So you, you record some scene on video like this one, you want to reproduce it later on your display. It would be nice if I wouldn't look uh, purple or blue or whatever, that sort of this bit color is roughly reproduced and that this is bluish. Uh, it would look really weird if that wasn't the case. <coughs> so color space is all about how do you reproduce color. And the mother of all color spaces is called uh, TIEXYZ, -E 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 based on studies done in the 1920s, um, where they actually try to figure out how does the eye see color, what is how is other sensitivities of the eye. And they basically figured out how to reproduce specific wavelengths using three different primary light sources. Uh, this is called the CEE, C, damn it, TIE RGB color space. Sort of the mother of all color spaces. And CIE is the Commission on Illumination. So you have commissions for everything, including color. They, they deal with color. Um, in practice, this turns out to be a fairly unwieldy color space for calculations. It turns out there are some negative values, which I don't understand uh, how that's possible, but in practice, I don't care. And they have a transformation that takes the RGB color space into what they call the XYZ color space, where everything is all nicely positive, uh, linear, and easy to calculate with. The only thing is you cannot... The, the, the primaries are imaginary, so the actual light sources that it's based on, they do not exist. Phys they're not physically possible. Uh, but it's just a linear transformation through a matrix from the RGB to the y to XYZ, and that's really all you need to know. I, it's, uh, this is the foundation of all color space. All color spaces are defined in relation to that one. And it is really cool to think of that this is based on studies done by a pool of 17 people over 85 years ago. It's quite, I think it's quite amazing that what they did then is still valid today. Um, good to know is that the Y describes luminance. X and Z are color components. Uh, th they're just letters. And if you think that is confusing, well, wait for it, it gets much more confusing. What I use often is XYZ lowercase, where XYZ lowercase are calculated like this. What I use a lot more is capital Y lowercase XY. It, uh, don't blame me. The nice thing about this one, this cap keeps the original Y standing for luminance, and the lowercase X and Y, based on this formula, they are valued for chromaticity. What it basically is, is these are the colors with maximum intensity. <coughs> so a color is both the color itself, and then you have how bright it is. So the Y is roughly the brightness, the luminance, and X and Y, lowercase, they are values that specify a color. Um, so if you're reading about this, then you will have to pay attention to 
what is typical or lowercase, and sometimes people don't do it quite right. So if you think it's confusing, it really is confusing. A color space means that, so okay, I, I know RGB, right? You have values for red, green, and blue, but what exactly color of red do you mean? You know, there are many, many colors of red, so which one do you mean? Which, which is the color of your red light source? And what is the color of your blue red light source and the green one? Because you need to know that in order to accurately reproduce a color. So you have these three lamps in, in a display, a projector, or sensors in a camera. And those, when you want to reproduce a color, you need to light them up with enough intensity so that you fake the eye of the receiver seeing a specific color. But if you have different colors for your light sources, you will need to trigger them in different ways. So color space is actually saying, okay, what, what are my colors? What are my light sources? I need a red one, a green one, and a blue one, but exactly what color red, green, and blue is it? And that is defined in usually this X lowercase x and y, because the capital Y is luminance, so we can discard that. That has nothing to do with the color aspect. And Basically, so you get a color space defined by which color of red, which color of green, which color of blue. And they basically say, if you pass in, give a display a red at the value at the maximum, say 25500 for an RGB, typical RGB display, then it's, that's the color that you get. You also need what's called a white point. That says, what color do I get if I turn on all the three lamps at maximum? Uh, you know, if you have RGB full out, you should get white. But you have many, many tints of white. So you can actually play with that to specify specifically which white you want. Um, usually it's what's called the D65, which is a standardized, uh, it's supposed to mimic daylight. Uh, but photographs apparently use D50, which is slightly different. I don't know the details. Uh, it's just numbers that you crunch and that you, you end up with a matrix. Uh, there used to be physical properties. So the old R CRTs, so where the colors get clustered in the, the cathode ray peak would give you. These days, they tend to be translated <coughs> by your display to whatever actual light sources you have. Any color space that is defined can be derived from the, the mother of all color spaces through a three by three matrix multiplication. That also means that you often hear about, well, this, this color space can only represent so many colors and that color space can be more. It's not really true. All color space, it's just a three by three matrix multiplication. So in theory, all color spaces can represent the same color. Uh, the problem comes that certain color spaces will have colors where you certainly have negative values and you can't have a minus 10 red value. It's not physically possible. For the calculation, you can still retrieve the original color. But once you go to the physical world, if you get negative values or values above one, they are cut off and that is what will limit the amount of colors that your physical device can reproduce. <coughs> so that, that is actually, that's very confusing in the beginning because you don't really understand why that is, but you have XYZ, capital XYZ color space that can reproduce all colors that the human eye can see. Every other color space can be the same, but once you go to the physical world, then you will have limitations. The original color spaces defined here, they're all linear. So if you double the value of red, you will get a red that is physically twice as intense as it, uh, as it was originally. The eye, like the ear, is not linear. So 
what they what every color space defines is what is called the transfer function. Unfortunately, it's also it's called gamma. That's not really the right name. Uh, transfer functions are a way of um, it's basically a power function. Uh, usually, the first part is linear, and then a power function takes over, and that is usually a lot more um, in tune with what the eye can see. So the eye is more sensitive with color differences in certain areas, and the power function compensates for that. In order to tell that the color is actually specified uh, after the power function has been applied, they use quotes. Well, sometimes they use quotes. Quite often they don't, because people have no idea about the transfer function, and they just say RGB. But it really is RGB. <coughs> Quoted, meaning that you know there has been a transfer function here first. <coughs> then you have the YCBCR, or also called YUV, also incorrectly, but again all historical. Um, that is derived from RGB. So why why YCBCR for those who don't know? Very quickly, why is so this RGB is red, green, blue, but for video you quite often want luminance and then two color components. The eye is more sensitive to luminance, so your luminance resolution is actually higher. The eye is less sensitive to color, color resolution, so the color resolution is actually lower. So it's a more efficient way for video to reproduce the scene, which means that you save bandwidth, which makes hardware manufacturers all happy. Uh, it's also why you typically don't do that for uh, you know your desktop screen, because this there you're close to your screen and you can actually see the effect of YCBCR that is not as, uh, uh, the color fidelity is not as good as it should be. But when you have moving video, you won't see it. Now co to convert from RGB to YCBCR, you again, you have a matrix and color spaces, they actually define which matrix you should use or make you set because there are different ways of doing it. YCBCR, contrary to what 90% of all documentation says, is not a color space. It's a different encoding for a color. How to interpret that color, that is what the color space does. That tells you what those three values actually mean, to what color do they, should they add up. Um, I see this all the time, I had the same uh, wrong idea in my head when I started out with this. And clearly most people writing documentation or data sheets will make the same mistake. Just a nice fact, um, OpenGL, if you use that, by default it expects linear RGB, so without the transfer function. Since most pictures that you get, JPEG, whatever, they are all with the transfer function, so they are RGB quoted. You need to tell that to OpenGL. If you don't do it, the image is misinterpreted. Just for fun. So this is what you have. You have the original color space. Then <coughs> you want to go to a color space, and I will get to that in the next slide, that you actually want to use. That's a three by three matrix. Then it passes through a transfer function. So all the red, green, and blue components, they are converted by that function to a new value. Nonlinear RGB. Then it can go through a three by three matrix to nonlinear YCBCR. And there is really is no <coughs> linear YCBCR, it's never used. Uh, and in the end, the last one is that you quantize it. So you go from this floating point value to say 16 to 235, and you discard any values outside of that range. So that's where you basically go to the physical world. Does everybody still follow it? <laughs> yeah. This is, no, this, this states how, whether, is it linear no, RGB? No, no, this, I'll come, let me just okay. first go a little bit to the color spaces themselves. I will do the first one first and then go back to your question. Okay. 
So sRGB, that's the best known because that's the default for any graphics work that you do. Uh, it's standardized by this standard. And so a color space is defined, first of all, it's defined by which color primates do you use. So what, what does it mean if you say red and green and blue? To which colors do they, re do they reproduce? Uh, that's also called chromaticity, same name for that. The chromaticities of sRGB are defined and are identical to recommendation. I, I should probably get those two leads. sRGB, computer graphic, color space, SN. CTE 170M, that is standard definition TV color space. Recommendation 709 is high definition color space. Just, just to give a little bit of context, all these standards, they all refer to one another. So you get really, really confused very quickly. Just think recommendation 701, high definition, 170M, standard definition, sRGB used for computer graphics. The fact that there are three, four very common applications is already an indication how confusing everything is, and that is one big bloody mess. So for sRGB, the chromaticities are identical to recommendation 709. I should go back to that. Chromaticities, they are going here. So those define which red, green, and blue um, lamps or sensors you are using, so what what colors are they sensitive to exactly? And they are relayed, they are defined in the standard. And in order to go from the original color, so the original pure perfect specification of a color to how you would encode it in that color space, you have a three by three matrix. Three by three matrix is calculated from the chromaticities that are part of the standard. Again, chromaticity is basically what color red, green, and blue do you use in your projector or display, and what color white do you get if you turn them all on at the same time. sRGB, however, so the chromaticities are the same as high definition TV. Great, perfect. They're interchangeable, you would think. No, they're not. Because they decided to have different transfer functions. So again, normal pictures and graph computer graphics, they are not done in linear RGB, they are done in non-linear RGB, with transfer function in between, power function is. Which is not the same between sRGB and HDTV. No idea why they didn't do that. Um, sRGB is almost always, as the, the standard name says, red, green, blue, so you rarely use the YCBCR. Uh, encoding again that's just a calculation it's just it's just a different way of representing a color it has nothing to do with the chromaticity uh, there is actually one defined SYCC so uh, it's I think it's used in some JPEG formats or uh, computer graphics not going into detail there then you have standard definition color space so that's the old style PAL 2 times G, also called SMT, SMCTEC. Um, the transfer function is the same as that for high definition, but it has slightly different chromaticity. So the actual, if you want to reproduce it, you would have slightly different red, green, and blue color. Um, how to encode from RGB to YCBCR is standardized by the BT601 standard. <laughs> now, lots of people probably have heard, if you're doing anything with video, you've heard about that one. The BT601 standard just defines how you go from RGB to YCBCR. It is not a color space. It says nothing about color. You could make it uh, purple and uh, polka dots uh, cut chromaticities, you would still use BT601 to convert from RGB to YCB. It's very often used called a color space. It's not. Uh, usually, if it's called like that, it's really an alias to this standard. There is, an, there is an alternative encoding that you can use. So by default, 601, they will encode in the range from roughly 16 to 235. There is one that will use the full range from 0 to 255. 
so that some of them can play them. Um, high definition color space. Uh, this is actually a very nice standard because it defines everything in just one standard. Uh, so what you have in practice, if you have standard definition TV, all right, following that standard, and you want to display it on, say, a high definition output, then the YCBCR encoding, I mentioned YCBCR encoding, is different between the two. The rest is all the same, but the YCBCR encoding is different. So you have to compensate for that. If you want to have an sRGB in it and display it to a high definition TV, everything is the same except for the bloody transfer function. So if you do not compensate for that, you will get the wrong color. Uh, the chromaticity between standard definition and high definition, or for that matter, sRGB, as I mentioned here, they are different. However, the differences are minute. I will actually show it later, that what the differences are. It's, it's basically not almost undetectable. So nobody cares about that. But you will see the difference between the YCBCR encoding and the transfer function. There are a few others that are in use. Uh, Adobe RGB. Um, not going into too much detail there. BT2020, that's an interesting one because that is the one that is going into ultra high definition TV, 4K. The standard is there, but as far as I'm aware, the equipment is still in research R&D. There might be some cinema systems out there that can actually do it, but I'm, I don't know if they exist. Definitely way above my pay grade to ever buy one from one of those things. Uh, the standard says that you only use it for a deep color, so 10 bits or more per component. Uh, BT2020 gives a much larger gamut. So the, the primaries are chosen in such a way, the primary colors are chosen in such a way that you can reproduce many more colors than the existing color spaces, physically reproducing it. So apparently you can get many more, uh, especially very highly saturated and almost glowing colors are next to impossible to reproduce with the existing color spaces, but that one should be able to do it, should be able to do a much better job. Uh, I've seen some uh, articles in the, in the press about that and it seems to be really, really cool. Um, some older ones, uh, 240M, that was basically for about 10 years in place for the early high definition equipment, has been superseded by Netting Radio 709. There is an old NTSC, the original color space, nobody uses it anymore. It is superseded by uh, 950M. The same for PAL and CECOM, again, going to the same color space. And so I told you the, the, the chromaticities of standard definition and high definition are slightly different, but it's almost undetectable. And in practice, um, TV companies and studios are going completely to 709 for that. The problem with high definition, you get signaling through the EDID and through info frames for HDMI or, or uh, auxiliary channels for display ports that tells you what color space to use. Standard definition TV, you do not have that information. So if you would, for example, play back a um, really old program that was done in the original color space, you wouldn't be able to know that. Uh, so that, that, really that information has to come from outside which color space standard definition uses. But in practice, it is simple. Um, oh, okay, I'm going a bit too far ahead. Um, limited and full range. So we had, you know, chromaticities. What red, green, and blue do you have? You have the transfer function, and then you have YCBCR encoding. And the last one is called quantization, so where you go from floating point to actual value. Now you have two, two possibilities. One is full range and the other is limited range. Now RGB typically are zero to two, five, five, full range quantization. YCBCR, 
typically limited range. But you have the alternate as well. So you have limited range RGB and you have full range YCB slide. I've seen this, I've never seen that. But HDMI connectors can fit in both. Unfortunately, HDMI, so you look to the spec and you look how do they handle color spaces and quantization and all that, that stuff, and it's really complicated. So this is, I think, in one slide, more or less what you, what you have to take care of. So if you, as a transmitter, if the sync, the receiver, cannot do, uh, doesn't support AVI info frames at all, so for example, a DVI connector or something like that, or you cannot handle YCB SLAR video, then for IT, so basically anything but uh, uh, standard definition or high definition resolution, you use full range sRGB, just what you would expect. If you're sending out standard definition or high definition, so you know PAL or 720p or something, you have to use limited range sRGB. I have no clue which idiot came up with that or why you would ever want to do that. That is the standard. If you do it wrong, you're likely to get wrong colors. Unfortunately, some equipment never implemented this, so they would, for example, expect full range anyway. It's an utter and total mess. So if you have HDMI, uh, please just fill in info frames and just give all the right information. I have not heard, if anyone knows why they came up with using limited range, RGB here, let me know, because I have no clue why you would ever want to do that. Anyway, if you are in a more sane situation, you actually have info frames, then again, you can signal that for graphic, computer graphic, you use full range. Standard definition, limited range, as in TTE once said. So standard definition, color spaces, high definition, recommendation. Uh, it supports a whole bunch of additional formats, including the new, the latest HDMI standard includes the new ultra high definition format as well. And well, you can signal. If you want to implement this, and I've been actually been doing that for the past two, three weeks in, in Linux drivers, uh, it's not easy. But luckily, this is my one minute guide. Standard definition, use that. High definition, use that. Anything else, use that. Y you're, you're okay if you just, but it's a very good default. So what are the problems with all this? First of all, highly confusing names. Uh, inconsistent, so you, you, you know, you, you have to calculate these 3.3 matrices. So you go through the literature and everybody has a slightly different matrix. Um, applications, most applications ignore this completely. Full range, limited and full range quantization, usually ignored or done incorrectly. Um, transfer functions uh, seem to be a really bad boy when it comes to hardware, where they just ignore it. So they go from, so the, the, the ADV7604 I've been looking at, that's the HDMI receiver. If you give it high definition TV and you want to convert it to RGB to show on your display, it uses the wrong, or it, it just ignores the whole transfer function stuff. So you end up with an sRGB picture that is not using the sRGB transfer function, but the one from recommendation 709. So it's actually wrong. Um, the good news is that support for all these color spaces, they have been added in kernel 3.19. Um, for display, so that this covers HDMI 2.0, as far as I can tell, completely. For display ports, there are a few missing, mostly because the display port standard basically says nothing about it. They say they are there, but they do not give me any pointers to standards or what it means. If anybody has experience with display ports and these color spaces, please let me know. The only one that I could figure out was VCI P3, which is used in cinemas, and there's a proper standard for that. Uh, it could be added, but I can't test it anyway, so I've ignored it for now. Uh, 
uh, some resources, some books. Firstly, this is very practical. This goes a bit, a lot more, or actually a lot more into the theory of color and, and, and physical and biological and everything related to it. One website that I found very useful goes a lot into the mathematics, going from one color space to another. How do the calculations work? And the video for Linux specification, this is the very latest version on my website. If you go to the steps on color spaces, I've completely rewritten it. And it's a fairly extensive and practical guide to how color spaces work. Four questions. I am trying, let's see if that works, to give a little bit of, um, give a demonstration. What, what exactly does it mean when you do something wrong with color? see if I can make this work. So what I'm part of now is the Vivid driver. Those who were in my previous presentation know a lot more about it. It's basically a video for Linux driver that is generating the image. And you can use it, it's, it's, it's emulating hardware. The nice thing about it is that it can emulate any color space. So I put in a lot of effort to that. So you can actually say generate pictures with, what you have here, sRGB color space. So this is what you would get. This is a standard color, uh, color bar. I'm not quite, I actually, if you look here in the test pattern, I've, this is the color space conversion color bar. I've paid special attention that all the colors used here can be represented accurately without going out of range in all the other color spaces. If you would go to, say, for example, a 100% color bar, where you have maximum values of blue and green and whatever, then they might be out of range in another color space. And that would fuck up everything. So if you want to compare colors, you just want to see the effect of different color spaces, you need to have colors that are reproducible by all the other color spaces. So let's this, uh, keep this as the, the reference. So this is how, of course, remember this. I have absolutely no clue what the color reproduction system is of that projector. So I'm not, I don't know if these color colors, probably not, they're probably not correct at all. What I'm interested in is to see the effect of doing something wrong with colors. So I just need to see the difference. So I am. Um, I have two instances of this test framework. I'm going to put the next one on. So the bottom one is the reference. That is what it should be. Uh, and the top, the top one is where I'm going to make changes. Now, first, if I just change the color space, nothing happens. Well, you see a very slight flickering sometimes, right? Uh, so QV402, which is the test utility I use, the, the application that, that reproduces, that makes a picture, it understands all these color spaces. And it sets up big shaders inside OpenGL that will convert from whatever it receives to sRGB, which is the output. So the, the flickering that you see is when it's, uh, it's, it's getting signaled that there is a new color space, but it is still displaying one frame with the old one. So that's all. So the next frame it will have been caught up and it's using the right shaders and just the right conversion. So changing color spaces here makes no effect. Um, I do need to make a small change here. I just remember why you do, I hope that's correct. Okay, I did that okay. So what I can do now is So let me send out sRGB, but I can now tell, so um, here I program the driver to send colors in a specific color space. And in this step, 
this is what the application will do. By default, it auto detects, so it just do whatever the driver gives you. But I can say, no, 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 I want interpreted as high definition TV. Now you see a difference, right? And this is the difference caused by a different transfer function. Because the transfer function is different between sRGB uh, bet and uh, the, the x what the norm and uh, no different between recommendation 709 and sRGB. So if you do not take that into the into account, you get the wrong color. And you will never see this. You know, if you're just watching a video or whatever, you will not see this. If you only see it if you put it next to one another, or perhaps if you're an artist and you're really experienced with color and you can can detect these things. I mean, if you're a photographer, if you're a cinema, I don't know, cameraman, you work with color all day. Uh, we had once I talked to people from General Motors. You know, they make new models and they, they really want to know what color your car is. That, that's important to them, that it's the right color. If you do not take it into account, you get, you reproduce the wrong color. Um, the other thing, so what happens if you, let me see, that is, S, that is sRGB versus recommendation 709. Now let's say standard definition. And so standard definition. Now I'm uh, <coughs> just out of speed. I'm saying use the one YCBTR conversion. So this is now converted using uh, this is I'm doing something. Yeah, the distances are fairly small. You can see it primarily in the green and here that these are different colors. But that is the effect that you get if you use the wrong YCBCR to RGB encoding. It's actually a bit more stronger uh, visible here in the in the laptop. Uh, if you let me get this right, auto detect. can show this better with uh, yeah. this is when you mess up full range and limited range it's, it's not uh, projector messes things up it's much better visible in my laptop perhaps if I switch it around um, full range that's a bit yeah, now it is a bit better visible, but this is too bright. That's if you if you handle limited and full range quantization incorrectly, then that's the effect that you get. Uh, one final one that I wanted to show. Um, let me see. This is, if I plot it, do I have it right? It's getting very complicated to see what you are sending and what you're receiving and how you interpret it. Yeah, that should do it. So these are the differences between the chromaticities of standard definition and high definition. Now as I said, it, it's, it's next to impossible to detect. And I'm going back and forth. Oh. 
we see very slight differences there. And yeah, and in practice, this is uh, well next to impossible to check. Most people just ignore that one. So with the Vivid tool, you can uh, you can use this to more or less detect differences between what 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 is the effect if I get it wrong to really see if the whole chain of your, your the whole solid chain is correct you need to do a lot more but at least this gives you an, an idea of if I do it wrong what are the results um, very nice as well this gener there's a generator inside here and also in uh, uh, video for Linux CPL2 CPL2 that test pattern generator can generate all those different color states so you can actually feed it straight into your HDMI transmitter loop it to an HDMI receiver and compare what you're sending in and what you're getting back to check whether your chain is correct, whether you're never messing up your color spaces. Uh, it's actually what I've been doing in the past two weeks at work, just making sure that uh, you know color isn't messed up somewhere around uh, in the link. Um, I hope this gives a little bit of an idea of the complexity that you get into if you have to deal with color. The QV for two tool is publicly available in the video CS Linux repository. It has all the shaders that you use to do the calculations. Uh, test pattern generator is also available. It, it does again, it does all the calculations to send out the right colors. So if you're interested in that and you want to work with it, then you can just look it up. I spend a lot of time in trying to get this right because the only way to check if your hardware is correct is to first have the right test suite. I always feel that I'm just scratching the surface. Uh, I also feel that I still really don't know everything there is to know about color, but at least I hope this gives a little bit of an, an impression of what is involved. And I'm opening up the floor for questions. They all do. A color, spa a color space needs to define. So the question is, are there any, any standards that, that define the white points? A proper standards dealing with color spaces will define the red, green, and blue primary and the white points. If it doesn't define the white points, <coughs> it's not a color space. If I remember correctly, it's in the FMCPE 170M standard. So it's not in the BT, if you're looking in the BT601 standard, it's not there, because that's not at all about that at all. So, but Fef 170M, I have all the, I bought all those standards. <coughs> uh, I'm pretty sure it's, it's there. Well, I know it's there. question is why do you need the white point at all the white point is necessary to um, so you have you have these three colors but you basically need to know if you put all colors the, the say the, the light bulb let's let's make it really physical if you give maximum power to all the white bulbs you should get the whitest color but which one is it exactly they may not you know you, if you put maximum power to it some might actually shine a little bit brighter than the others, so you might come up with a slightly greenish white or a slightly bluish white. Uh, you don't want that. So the white point is actually telling you, effectively it's telling you how much power you should give to each primary to achieve that white, that specific white color. There, there are multiple ways how you could describe white points. But I think that is the most practical. So you actually, it's a way of fine tuning your color space so that if you tell it to go to maximum power, where do you end up? Uh, another way of describing it is that it gives you the relationship of uh, how much, what the maximum values are for each color. 
maximum power that you can give each color. Uh, it took me, uh, it's, it's complicated and it actually took me also quite a long while before I got a okay-ish idea of what it meant. I think it's fairly poorly described in practice. But you can, the easiest way for me is just to say, if I want to give 255, 255, 255 to my display, what white should I enter for? And that translates to how much power should the three light sources get to get there. Best way I can describe it. More questions? <coughs> Is there a technical advantage using limited range or full range? Uh, short answer is no. Uh, why is limited range used? It basically comes from, again, the old style analog systems where you needed headroom because it was all analog. So sometimes your, your electrical signal would actually dip below your minimum or go above your maximum. So you needed headroom to accommodate that. It's basically uh, a legacy thing from old CRTs. Although I know that some decoders, MPEG decoders, for example, they can have rounding errors where you effectively can end up in roughly the same situation. Oh, uh, yeah. Embedded sync, that's another one. No more questions? Who actually understood this? How, how understandable? <laughs> everybody is colorblind. <laughs> Okay, thank you.